so we're now recording. Uh, this is the optional review session for the composite materials exam tomorrow. Uh, I thought we'd just take this time and go over the um, sort of study guide that I sent out. And the study guide is in there in Microsoft Word format or PDF format. I mean, if you want to just like kind of follow along in the Microsoft Word format and sort of like type stuff in as you go, it's probably the best method. Um, and I specifically included like the Word document in case you wanted to like type along at this particular time. So. Uh, at least one dog cameo required in this review. Uh, okay, I'll do my best. Maybe we'll have like a halfway point where Rocky makes an entrance. I'm here with two other dogs too, two other family dogs, Duke and Barkley. They're also awesome. All right, big old chocolate labs. Sorry, uh, black labs. All right, so enough of this shenanigans. Let's get on with the review. Two doges, it's actually three doges. All right, so uh, I'll share my screen here quickly, and we're going to be talking about this review guide here. So this review document is more or less all encompassing for like the qualitative type questions that I want you to understand for this exam. And kind of a lot of the front end of the material that we talked about in class was rather qualitative related to composites. So what is a composite? What makes up a composite? Um, how do we manufacture composites? What are the benefits? What are the drawbacks? so on and so forth, okay? And so a lot of the tests that you're going to see tomorrow is going to have some of these qualitative type questions. And that's just because the front end of this class is very materials-based and sort of qualitative questions, okay? Uh, at the very end, we'll talk about quantitative questions, and I think it's pretty easy to understand what kind of quantitative questions are coming, mostly like help and side type questions, okay? So uh, without further ado, let's just kind of get right into it. And so I copied this um, part of the study guide just right over to this um, writing pad here, and I'm just going to kind of write over the top of this. So without further ado, let's just kind of get right into it. And I'll uh, sprinkle the dogs in here maybe halfway through so that we can wake up. Maybe we'll have a One Direction interlude. All right, what's our definition of a composite? Uh, a composite is a material comprised of two or more physically distinct materials. Um, that come together in some way to provide a benefit that has a benefit over kind of the original materials. So you have to be able to justify their use together in some way um, to give you a benefit. Now, we had some examples of things that were not composites, like all alloys are not really composites because you can't really physically see let's say the potassium inside of an aluminum alloy. Okay, you can't really just find that. Or the chromium in a stainless steel alloy. Like, yeah, it's there, and maybe if you have a super strong microscope or an X-ray you know, diffraction machine, you could tell that it's there, but you can't really see that by eye. So you have to be able to really distinguish the two um, different pieces. What three components comprise a composite? Matrix reinforcement interface. If you don't have all these three things, you don't have a composite. So we kind of like talked about this, and if you remember some of the examples from the first homework, it was like we had a shirt that was made of cotton and polyester fibers. Well, it's not really a composite. I mean, yeah, you have cotton fibers, you have polyester fibers, but what's the matrix phase? I mean, unless you like spill some ketchup on your shirt and it like hardens, then maybe okay, maybe the ketchup, the hardened ketchup is your matrix phase, but um, <laughs> quit spilling ketchup on your shirt. All right. Uh, Matrix reinforcement interface. Multiple examples of composite materials. We have many of these in the notes, right? We've talked about dental composites. We've talked about lithium ion batteries. We've talked about fiber reinforced composites. If there's no interface, how does that affect the non-composite? Um, I don't understand the question. Is ketchup a thermoplastic? Not to my knowledge. Does it just fail basically immediately? Uh, well, fibers don't hold compression very well, so if you're compressing a single fiber, yes, by buckling, it fails immediately. Are you able to provide multiple examples of matrix and reinforcement materials? Again, there are many examples of these in the notes. Matrix materials, pretty much anything. I mean, a glass could be a matrix materials. Uh, you could have any sort of ceramic, any polymer, any, you know, 
metal could be a matrix. So we have many, many uh, examples of these matrix and reinforcement materials in the notes. All right, next. Are stricter and stronger than many composites. Why would we use composites over these other materials? That comes down to specific properties. That's usually the answer. If you are stronger and stiffer by density, the specific property, remember that's kind of the definition of being a specific property, is the property normalized by density, then you're probably better off. So specific properties are your answer there. What are the drawbacks of advanced continuous fiber reinforced composites? What say ye audience? What are the drawbacks? I know I always talk about how awesome they are, but they are not without the drawbacks. Cost. Excellent. Other drawbacks. Hard to detect failure. Excellent. Anisotropy, excellent. Low fracture toughness, excellent. Complex failure modes, excellent. Complicated, says Jack Terzak, excellent. Hard to manufacture, depends. Hard to manufacture, depends? I don't know. Procter & Gamble seems to do a pretty good job. Yeah, all of these things. Anisotropy. Expensive. I'll say manufacturing is difficult. Expensive. Etc. All right. What approximate temperature ranges can we expect polymer matrix composites to operate? Metals, ceramics. All right. I can maybe do this one sort of on the side here, and we'll talk about Tmax. For polymers, that's maybe 200 degrees Celsius max. For metals, 800. For ceramics, depends on the ceramic, but let's say 2,000 would probably be appropriate. 2,000 degrees C. Depends on the ceramic. Um, different ceramics have different melting points or service temperatures, I guess you would say. We commonly talk about continuous fibers as reinforcements. What other types of reinforcements are common? Okay, so we have Ford C Max. I don't know that. What other types of reinforcements are common? Well, we have particulates, flakes, whiskers, short fibers, etc. So particles, flakes, short fibers. Those would be some commons. What's the purpose of the matrix in the composite? Well, the matrix has a couple of sort of functions. One is to provide chemical resistance, one is to provide load sharing to the fibers, and one is to just give general shape. Right? So I'll say shape, chemical resistance, and um, just maybe load sharing. So load share. It's like rideshare, but better. What's the difference between a thermoset and a thermoplastic polymer? Which one is recyclable? All right. The difference between thermoplastic and thermoset is comes down to basically recyclability, which one can be reheated to be reformed. And the one that is recyclable is thermoplastic. So we'll say T-plastic. Not to be confused with T-pain. What's he like famous for? What's his famous song? He doesn't go, okay. I think that's Little John. Isn't he famous for I'm on a boat? Is he famous for I'm a boat? He's got his flippy floppies? I don't know. Or is he straight flipping copies? I don't know. I think he's famous for auto-tune because he can't sing by himself. You don't want to hear that. All right. What is gel time for a thermal set resin? How does temperature affect gel time? All right, so gel time for a thermal set is basically the amount of time that you have to work with it before it hardens. So I'll just say it's basically like the working time. Before solid, let's just say. And as 
T goes up, then time to work goes down. And that's because um, with more temperature, you're exciting the reaction to proceed more quickly. So if you're processing your material at a higher temperature than like let's say room temperature, then your gel time is going to go down because that reaction is going to proceed more quickly. All right. Are thermal sets or thermal plastics more brittle? Well, that's thermal sets. That's because they have this like cross-linked glassy type structure. Are thermal sets or thermal plastics more chemically resistant? Again, that's thermal sets. I'm in love with the uh, adult entertainer. Do thermosets or thermoplastics generally form better chemical bonds with continuous fiber reinforcement? This one's a little tricky, but because thermosets, when they go through their chemical reaction, don't typically react 100%, usually there's some chemical moieties that are floating around that haven't quite reacted perfectly with one-to-one -one ratio of everyone else. Usually there's some residual sort of moieties that are floating around. And fibers can leverage this by cohesively bonding to those excess moieties. So thermal sets actually have a better chemical bond, usually with the reinforcement, sort of by design. So why are metal matrix composites rare in practice? Well, because they're freaking heavy. Okay. The benefits of composite generally is that they have good specific properties good strength to weight ratios. And if you're going to use a metal, well, metals are freaking dense already. So why would you use a metal matrix if your whole purpose of using composites is to lighten up your material? It doesn't really make a lot of sense. What about the bond strength? The bond strength of metal matrices, also very low. Yeah, yeah. so heavy and poor bonds. Bonds. Or bonds. Next. What applications call for ceramic matrix composites? Audience. High heat. High temperature. All right. What's the major drawback of ceramic matrix composites? They're still ceramic, so they're super brittle. Brittle. That's number one. They're also so, really hard to make. Yeah, like hard to make. So, they crack really easy because yeah, they're good. brittle. Brittle, hard to manufacture. And I would say generally because of those, you know, because it's hard to manufacture, they're expensive. If you have a metal or if you have a ceramic matrix, that sort of implies that you're going to have a ceramic fiber as well because why would you have a ceramic matrix if you're not going to use a ceramic fiber as well for high temperature resistance? So ceramic fibers are actually like really, really difficult to make and really expensive. Um, aside from maybe a couple like glass fibers or ceramics that are somewhat easy to make, but most ceramics like silicon carbide, boron nitride, etc., they're actually really hard to make. So it makes it difficult to make. Generally expensive. All right. Purpose of reinforcement in a composite. Carry load. Bam. What materials are common as a for reinforcement phase of a composite? This is kind of a buried in the notes a little bit. But what materials are common for reinforcement phase? You know, we think like glass, carbon, etc. Those are pretty common. Um, but more generally, uh, I was kind of advocating for sort of like the low molecular weight materials. Um, but we'll just go with what we generally know. So glass, carbon, polymer. Those are the most common. Polymer being like all things polymeric, including like Kevlar and Vectran and Dyneema, ultra high molecular weight polyethylene, etc. Those commonly made into fibers. So I'll just generally classify those as polymer. Um, we also see some natural fibers, but those are much less common because it's hard to form bonds actually with natural materials. So also natural materials can die because they're natural and that really restricts their use. All right. 
All right. Regarding glass Kevlar carbon, which fiber types? Cheapest, isotropic, blah, blah, blah. So the cheapest, this will be glass, are isotropic. Glass is isotropic. Transversely isotropic, carbon and Kevlar are both transversely isotropic. Which is the strongest? Carbon fiber is the strongest, um, highest strength to failure. Which is the toughest? That's Kevlar. Which has the best chemical resistance? This one's going to be glass. So these are all just general things that you should consider when you're sort of using a reinforcement. Sorry, which one's expensive, which one's not expensive? Um, what material properties do I have to consider? All these sorts of things, okay? Sorry, just one second. Okay. What's the fiber sizing? It's how big the fiber is. No, incorrect. Fiber sizing. It's a chemical treatment on the fiber that helps with the interface. So it's not the actual dimensions of the fiber when we're talking about a fiber sizing, okay? Describe the basic process for making both glass and carbon fibers. Now, I'm not gonna write all of those processes here. Just make sure you revisit the notes and check on that. Glass fiber processing and carbon fiber processing are very different. So make sure you know the general differences between those. What are the differences in chemical structures of glass, carbon, and Kevlar? Well, glass, has the backbone of silicon dioxide, so O with SI coming off of it, and connected to other silicon dioxides, etc. All right, so that's generally your glass. Carbon fiber, you want to look up your um, basal, basal planes um, or sort of that general graphitic structure um, that sort of looks like, you know, a hexagon in the plane and then hexagons above that in another plane, right? It's called the turbostratic structure. Uh, and then Kevlar is, you know, your general thermoplastic. So it's these, you know, long chains of stuff um, kind of connected inside of themselves, right? So long polymer chains. Right, so Kevlar itself is a thermoplastic material. What's a fiber toe? It's when the fiber breaks down, it, it needs to be picked up by AAA. <laughs> no, just kidding. Fiber toe is a collection of uh, fibers in a bundle. It's more or less a bundle. Ah, so like my car, exactly. How many fibers in a typical bundle? Uh, it kind of depends, but anywhere from like 1,000 to 15,000 is probably common. One thousand to fifteen thousand fibers. What's the difference between a yarn and a roving? This is kind of a tough one that a lot of students get wrong when I ask on tests. So, what's the difference between a yarn and a roving? Yarn's twisted. Yarn has twist. Excellent. Who was that, Andrew? Damn, nice. All right, a yarn has twist. Be able to identify plain twill and satin weaves. Why would you pick one woven architecture over another? Ooh, that's kind of a hard one. I can't really draw them here, but maybe I can bring in pictures of um, these weave styles just so we're kind of on the same page of what these weaves look like. So let me, let me grab those quick. If I remember right, the reason of picking one over the other had to do with um, the, the bending of the fiber. Yeah, that's, that's a pretty good way to, to think about it. But here, these are the different types. So we have plain weave, twill weave, and satin weave. So you want to be able to like identify these if I were to put a picture of them on the test. All right. Plain weave, twill weave, satin weave. 
why would you pick one over another? Well, Xavier was kind of getting to the point there, is that you have drapeability. That's kind of the, the fancy industry term. How drapeable is it? How easy is it, easy is it to sort of like push it into a curvature of a mold versus strength? Okay. So um, something that is more drapeable tends to have lower strength. Something that is higher strength tends to be less drapeable. So a more drapeable fabric would be like a satin weave, which would be the most drapeable. And then the highest strength would be a plain weave. All right, so know the difference. Be able to identify or, or know an adhesive and cohesive bond. So the basic, basically the big difference between adhesive and cohesive bonds is that an adhe adhesive bond is strictly like a mechanical bond. So that's like sticking duct tape to the wall. There's no actual chemical bond there. It's just one thing stuck to another versus a cohesive bond, which is actually a chemical bond. So if you're making a composite, which one is desirable? Oh, David posts some stuff. Dang, look at that. Dang, I need that figure, David. Smoothness. I wonder how they measure smoothness. Is that just like how it feels in your hand? Because satin is just so smooth in my hand. Yeah. Okay. So which one's better, mechanical or chemical? Well, obviously you want to try to shoot for as much chemical bonding as possible, because this is going to be a better bond. Dang, David, that's a dope, that's a dope figure. Where did you get that? Is that in the textbook? That's not in the textbook. Is that on like composites.com or something? The goggle, he went to goggle, all right. Let's continue. So I'm going to copy sort of the next portion here. Let's talk about composite manufacturing. You guys are all, whoa, wh wh why did that just happen? Why is it doing that? Come on. So that worked. All right, so let's talk about manufacturing. You guys are all experts on composite manufacturing, right? After that manufacturing document that you all wrote for me. What processing variables can we control during composite manufacture? Well, the biggest ones that we care, really care about are pressure, temperature, and time. Those are really the things that we have control over and that pressure might be vacuum pressure, negative pressure, or actually applied pressure if you're in an autoclave, so positive pressure, temperature, and time. What differentiates dry and wet manufacturing processes? Well, that's whether or not you apply resin to the fabric before or after laying in the mold. And this would encompass everything prepreg related as well. So prepreg obviously would be anything using prepreg as a wet manufacturing process. And that's because prepreg already has the resin on it before you put it into the mold or you lay it with tape or you filament wind it or whatever. Okay. So anything prepreg is, is wet. Understand the basics of the following processes. Um, yeah. Okay. You wrote a whole flipping paper on this. All right, so you better understand those processes and you better believe that there's going to be questions on your test about those processes. Which of them is a wet or a dry process? All right, well, if we consider like wet processes, that would be, um, I guess, filament winding partially. Um, that's pretty much it. And I'll put this like kind of partially. And then if you want to talk about dry processes, well, basically all of these processes here are more or less dry. 
unless you want to think about vacuum bagging where you're already applying resin to the mold before you're putting it on. So vacuum bagging could involve prepreg or it could involve wetting the fabric before you put it on the mold. So um, that's probably more of a wet process than a dry process. I got a quick question. It, it, yeah, question. Oh. Go ahead. So about the protrusion process. Yeah. Um, so that's where it takes, pulls all the uh, fibers from all like the yarns into the cross section mold. And then it kind of puts it under like the uh, like a waterfall of resin. W would that not be considered uh, <laughs> a, a what process? Yeah, it's not really a waterfall. So all the fibers are kind of being pulled into the mold and then they like dip down into the into the resin bath usually before they go into the mold. So I would say it's probably more of a wet process than a dry process. So if I had to if I had to pick one gun to my head, I'd say it's probably a wet process rather than a dry process. Okay. Because it's usually coming into the mold with wet fibers. So okay, I'll give you that one. Thank you. All right. Advantages, disadvantages of each process. Okay, you should know these from writing your paper. I'm not going to write them all here. That would take up the whole space. What is prepreg and what two processes are used to fabricate prepreg? That one's a hard one. So what is prepreg? Um, it's fabric with resin already applied. It could be frozen um, as sort of like an intermediate material to be used later. That's commonly what's done with prepreg. So it will be manufactured and then frozen to be used later. But if you have like dry fabric in front of you and you paint resin onto it with like a paintbrush, like let's say you mix up your epoxy and you just like paint it on the fabric, that is prepreg. You're holding prepreg in your hand. It's pre-impregnated fabric that you're about to put on a mold. All right. So resin already applied. There you go. What two processes are used to fabricate prepreg? All right. Tricky, tricky, tricky. Solvent. The two processes are, who's got it? Uh, solvent and hot melt. Ah, yes. Very good. Solvent impregnation. And hot melt. Hot melt processing. I'd say solvent impregnation is more of a small scale laboratory type process. So small scale. Anything that you get from any industrial manufacturer, um, think of any large fabric producer that you want. Uh, Zoltec, um, whatever you want. APCM, uh, there's, you know, obviously many, um, but hot melt pre Hot melt processing is going to be responsible for any large volume. All right. And that's mostly because the solvent impregnation process relies upon evaporation of the solvent from the resin bath, which does take some time. And um, you can't ramp up that production as fast as you can do with some, some like the hot melt processing techniques. What is an autoclave? And what are the benefits and drawbacks of using an autoclave? Well, an autoclave is basically like a big pressure vessel. All right, the benefit? Best volume fractions. Drawback? It's expensive. It's a huge piece of equipment. Not only is it expensive to just make that equipment and install that equipment in the first place. So what I would call a capital expenditure, but also it's really expensive to run the machine. I mean, you got to fill this giant autoclave with nitrogen, which is not free. And you got to fill, you know, and if that's, if you're pressurizing with nitrogen, um, you've got to run the vacuum pump to like pull air out of your mold. You've got to obviously provide all the heat and, you know, have some operator that's processing that, man, that, that's not cheap. Okay. Why do we degas liquid resin? Audience. Avoid the voids. Avoid the voids. I like that. Avoid the void. So it removes 
bubbles from resin. Avoid the void, as they say in Stranger Things. All right, let's continue. Bless you, David. <laughs> Instantly mutes his mic. Okay, good job. <laughs> All right, let's continue. Here are micro mechanical models. What assumptions do we make for mechanics and materials parallel and series models? Good question. All right, for both, we assume perfect bond. Okay, and we also assume linear elastic behavior. Okay, so those two assumptions we make for both models. Then for the parallel and series model, we also make additional assumptions that are different for each model. And for the parallel model, we assume isostrain. strain. And for the series model, we assume iso stress. If you don't know what that means, go back to the notes. Right. What is the general rule of mixture and inverse rule of mixtures? What mechanical properties are best approximated with these rules? Okay. Well, the rule of mixtures looks something like property of the composite is property of the matrix, volume fraction of the matrix, plus property of the fiber, volume fraction of the fiber. Inverse rule of mixtures looks something like one over the property of the composite is volume fraction of the matrix over property of the matrix, plus volume fraction of the fiber over property of the fiber. So you should know those sort of quickly offhand. Uh, rule of mixtures here would be good for modules in the one direction and Poisson's ratio one, two. Inverse rule of mixtures would be good for E2 and G12. So those two, Colin, do it with me. Suspicious. Okay. These guys here, big check marks. These guys here, a little bit questionable. All right. Not as good. How did we derive the help and psi equation from parallel and series mechanics and materials approach? Uh, that's more of a philosophical ethereal takes five pages of notes type question. So make sure you go revisit that. But the general idea is modeling the composite with some portion that's sort of got the fibers that are sort of in parallel with matrix material and then separately sort of in parallel with just matrix. So uh, make sure you just sort of generally understand that idea. More important, which values of Xi for help and Psi correspond to parallel and series responses? Uh, well, the parallel response is Xi is infinity and hopefully you remember this fondly from your homework problems. In the series model, Xi is zero. Xi is infinity for parallel and zero for series. All right. What values of Psi are commonly used to calculate these parameters? All right, these you should know offhand. So your parameter E1, E2, G12 and G12. The value of Xi that's appropriate. For E1, we want to use the parallel model. So here it's infinity. For E2, the common value, if you're going to approach the series model as zero, but in actuality, in general practice, the value of Xi for E2 is usually two. For new one two, we're also going to use the parallel model. And for G12, an appropriate value for Xi is one. That's mostly based on empirical work. It's based on experiments and people have sort of concluded that if you're going to estimate properties, those are good values. Right. Here, what are we trying to account for in our with elasticity method? 
Um, this is the Cox model. Um, we didn't really talk a ton about elasticity method, so maybe I'll disregard this. Maybe you can just disregard this guy. What assumption did we relax compared to assumptions for mechanics and materials methods? Let's just get rid of this guy completely. This is not something we talked about. I sort of skipped over this and for reasons of time. Plane strain bulk modulus. Um, we talked about this a little bit. Um, again, this is something you can skip. I'm not going to ask about this. All right, so forget about those two guys. For line short fiber composites, we had a simplistic modified help and psi equation, as well as an in-depth derivation using the shear correction factor. So understand the differences between these two. We have two models that we're using to calculate properties of short fibers, a simplified model and the full shear lag model, which is sometimes called the Cox model. So be aware of the differences on how we derive that. The Cox model sort of assumes that there's a stress distribution in the fiber and the simplified model does not. All right, so those are the main differences. We'll say Cox model is stress distribution in fiber. So hopefully that jogs your memory to know that the Cox model assumes that there's this sort of gradient in how much stress can be held inside the fiber as you move along the length of the fiber. What is the alignment parameter for a partially aligned short fiber composite and how is it used in the micromechanical model for partially aligned short fiber composites? All right, well, let's bring this one down here. So remember for partially aligned composites, we had sort of like this modified rule of mixtures that was something like E1 is your shear lag parameter, then your alignment parameter times modulus of the fiber, volume fraction of the fiber, plus modulus of the matrix, volume fraction of the matrix. Where here, this is your alignment parameter. And we had a general equation for this alignment parameter in the notes. And it was something like the summation of the angle theta i, sorry, not angle theta i, the number of fibers that are aligned in the theta i direction multiplied by cosine four of that angle theta i, all divided by the total number of fibers that you're looking at. And this was specific for partially aligned fibers where you have a cross section of a composite where fibers are somewhat like partially aligned. And maybe there's a angle between the loading that you're putting on this guy and the actual angle of the fiber itself. We call this angle here theta. So how many fibers in your cross section have that particular angle? Multiplied by the fourth power cosine of that angle divided by the total number of fibers in your um, count. Okay. But generally this value would range from zero to one. If your composite has like full alignment, then that value of the alignment parameter will be one and you will approach the aligned the fully aligned model, which just has this sort of A to L um, shear lag term. All right. Now, for random short fiber composites, why do we only prescribe one elastic modulus and one shear modulus and one Poisson's ratio? Someone in the audience. If we're randomly aligned, why do we only prescribe one? Because it's basically like isotropic at that point. Yeah, it's isotropic in behavior. And I'll say isotropic at macro scale. Okay, so if you're not zoomed in at like one particular fiber location, if you're kind of taking this as a whole with many, many fibers on a grand macro scale, you could sort of assume that it's isotropic, right? For particular composites, what range of particle sizes are appropriate for Lewis Nielsen? This is also in the notes. Anyone know that offhand? Should revisit that one. One micrometer less than the diameter of the fiber, less than one millimeter is appropriate. 
size for Lewis, Lewis Nielsen. Hey, Justin knew it. Crickets is not the appropriate size. Those are usually larger than one millimeter. If you got crickets in your composite, don't use Lewis Nielsen. Too large. All right, last thing we'll talk about, that's this little bit of anisotropic material behavior. My family is watching a Lifetime Network movie in the other room. Can you guys hear it? The actor is crying right now. It's very dramatic. What's the movie? <laughs> I don't know. Lois goes home for Christmas. I don't know. <laughs> The plot is a girl in the sand. She meets a guy who's a bad guy, but it turns out to be a good guy, and they end up getting married at the end. That's all the movies. <laughs> exactly. Their families hate each other, but they reconcile at the end. <laughs> all right, let's go with anisotropic behavior. How many independent material constants are required to describe a generally anisotropic material which obeys conservation of angular momentum as Cauchy elastic? Wow, that's a mouthful. Yeah, you can ignore those things, Xavier. It has to do with the elasticity model, which I sort of skipped over because we were running low on time. All right, Riley says 21. I don't know if he's talking about the legal drinking age or number of constants required, but either answer, he's correct. All right, this guy, 21. All right. Good to sort of vaguely understand these two ideas. The idea of conservation of angular momentum. Um, this guy telling you that shear stress XY is equal to shear stress YX. That's where that comes from. Cauchy elastic, this is a little bit more of a graduate level topic, which if you ever take a continuum mechanics class in graduate school, uh, some of you might, um, you'll understand that or get to learn about that in much more detail. All right, how do we represent 3D stress and strain in contracted initial notation? Okay, so normally you would write this as like sigma ij is like this three by three matrix and epsilon ij is this three by three matrix, but in contracted notation, we write it as like sigma i, which is like a six by one, and epsilon j, which is also like a six by one. So this is contracted. And that's because we know these three by three matrices here contain redundant entries if we have conservation of angular momentum. So things like tau xy equals tau yx is just sort of a redundant sort of thing. Okay. So instead of writing this three by three matrix with nine values where three of them are redundant, we just say, forget those redundant values. We don't need that. We're going to just write it as a six by one in this contracted notation. All right. How do we use symmetry and coordinate system transformations to eliminate material constants? All right, we've talked about this. So this is that idea of like, if you have some composite with a plane of symmetry, that's like a composite, maybe let's say with fibers running in this direction, and you have like the one two direction here and we want to go to a new coordinate system that's like a one prime two prime coordinate system well we can look at the stiffness matrix c in the one two three coordinate system and say that's equal to the stiffness matrix in the one prime two prime three prime coordinate system and with transformations we can say that this is equal to t times c one, two, three times T star inverse. Okay. So these guys here will contain a bunch of zeros and ones. 
and when multiplied appropriately, things will cancel out. So you'll see like C14 equal negative C14 and etc. So this implies then that like C14 is equal to zero. And I went through the whole rigmarole here in one of our initial anisotropic material lectures. So hopefully this is sort of ringing a bell to you. Okay, next. How many material constants are required to fully describe monoclinic, orthotropic, transversely isotropic, and isotropic? So I gave you a chart with this information. It's on slide eight of lecture six. So go revisit that if you want. Monoclinic, 13. Orthotropic, nine. Transversely isotropic and isotropic are five and two respectively. Okay. How many planes of symmetry and isotropy in a monoclinic, orthotropic, transversely isotropic, and isotropic? All right. So if we do symmetry isotropy and monoclinic, it's one, zero. Orthotropic, it's three, zero, or yeah, three, zero. Transversely isotropic is infinity one <laughs> sounds seems a little bit weird but remember transversely isotropic materials have one plane of isotropy so that plane of isotropy technically has infinite planes of material symmetry and then an isotropic material here is infinity and infinity okay we done that's all kind of the qualitative material i would expect you to know for this test um, the exam itself is going to be qualitative questions on the front end, like a good number of qualitative questions. And then I have two workout questions on the back end, which I think are relatively straightforward. Okay. So that's what the exam is actually going to look like. One last thing I do want to cover is I'll just show what I expect you to maybe know. Anything with rule of mixtures or inverse rule of mixtures is on the table. Straightforward with someone with a PhD. Yeah, okay. Uh, okay, straightforward also for you, Alex. You can do it. Anything with ruler mixtures or inverse ruler mixtures. If you walk away from this class and you don't know rule of mixtures or inverse ruler mixtures, I will be very disappointed. Okay, so got to know that. Anything related to help in Psi equation, including modifications of Psi for elasticity. Uh, you don't need to worry about this. Um, not including this. This is not a thing. Consider it here. We're not making modifications for elasticity. Anything related to help and for continuous composites. You've done this enough, right? What is the value of xi for E2? Two. Go to town on your calculations. All right. You need to know how to use the help and psi equation if you're going to pass this class. Okay. Again, if you walk out of this class and you don't remember that equation, I'm going to be disappointed in you and in myself. All right. Elastic moduli for aligned short fiber composites using the simplified model. Okay, so that simplified model, how do we how do we execute that? You should know that. And then elastic modulus, shear modulus, Poisson's ratio of randomly aligned. So remember the randomly aligned short fiber composite model uses the aligned short fiber values. Okay, so if we kind of pull up our equation sheet here, I'll just remind you of this. Here's your oft intimidating equation sheet for this class. But one thing here is that <clears throat> for random short fibers, you have this general equation, which is not being highlighted very easily, but uses E1 and E2. You have to remember that this E1 and this E2 are for the aligned short fiber model. So that would be the E1 and E2 you would calculate with this aligned short fiber model here. Don't forget that that's probably going to come up all right, same thing with this G value. It uses E1 and E2 of the simplified aligned short fiber model. You did it on your homework. Don't forget it. All right, elastic model, just one direction for fully aligned short fiber using the COTS model. So that's the more advanced model here using this little b. You did this on your homework as well. And this lag, shear lag factor eta L, you did that on your homework. Remember, you have open everything, so if you need to use the hyperbolic tangent function, maybe you use MATLAB. 
maybe. Elastic modules for partially aligned short fiber composites, given an alignment parameter and reinforcing parameter. Okay. Shear elastic modules of a particular composite using Lewis Nielsen. You also did this on your homework, so you should be comfortable doing it. That's it. 850 on the dot. Sorry, 750. Facts. Bears beats Battlestar Galactica. Are qualitative questions multiple choice? Don't be silly. No. Yeah, free response. Which bear is best? Which bear is best? False. Black bear. Which NFL team do you support? I support the Packers because I'm from Wisconsin originally. So if you don't like that, go eat some cheese and you'll change your mind. Um, so uh, do you have open book, open notes, or uh, is that another teacher? Yeah, open everything, whatever Okay, because I know okay. some professors do other stuff. I'm just making sure. Yeah. <laughs> My exam instructions are on Blackboard, so please look at those. Right. Open everything. You can use MATLAB to check your answers if you want. You have to write enough information on the paper so that I know what you're doing. You can't just say, I did this in MATLAB, period. Show me the equation that you used. Show me the numbers that you punched in to get there, okay? Like if you have to use the, use the shear lag factor, write like A to L equals tangent hyperbolic, all this stuff, okay? Then say, I did this calculation of MATLAB and put the number down. Show me everything, okay? Yeah. Sounds good. Thank you. Which, which NHL team do I support? I support the Detroit Red Wings. They had glorious years in the 90s with Steve Eiserman and Sergei Fedorov and F Fetisov, who's got an amazing story, and Scotty Bowman's the best NHL coach to ever live. So there you go, Detroit Red Wings. What about attaching the MATLAB file? Does that kind of showing your work? No, 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 MATLAB. Just, just if you need to check your answer, do it there. I don't, I don't want a bunch of MATLAB code. You're not going to need it. I promise. It's the uh, calculations aren't that hard. You're not going to have any like crazy matrix algebra. I promise. <laughs> it's not tanking the Blackhawks organization. Whatever. His eleven rings are too heavy. He can't hold his hands up anymore. I thought you were from Illinois. No, I'm from Wisconsin. Pizza rolls or pizza rolls? Um, I'd rather throw up. <laughs> OK, any other questions related to the exam? OK, uh, we'll call it here now for uh, non-nonsense information. From here on out, warning, all nonsense. OK. Thanks for coming. See you guys later.